the leper scholar versus Jesus in Isaiah 53. The speaker of verses 7 through 10 is Isaiah himself. Verse 7, he was maltreated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to slaughter, like an ooh, dumb before those who shear her, he did not open his mouth. This isn't about sheep. This isn't about unblemished lambs. This is about not opening your mouth. That's just, I don't know, metaphor or symbolic of the sheep being led to slaughter. This verse can be identified in the book of Ezekiel. Again, the key to understanding Isaiah 53. God maltreats him, not man. Maltreatment is a part of being chastised and punished by the words and power of God to make, be made suitable for his purpose. With God, you are always submissive. It is necessary to break the will of a man that is going to be the servant of God to temper and calm his soul and emotions. Ezekiel said he went in bitterness and the fury of his spirit in the hand of God. The chastisement, punishment, maltreatment, crushing and bruising in God's fire of refinement is to remove this bitterness and furious nature of Ezekiel. It is to make a man meek and, and humble. Moses was called the most humble man on earth at the end of his life. God had him for 40 years. Ezekiel was sent to his house and God bound him with the cords of his power so that he could not go out among the people. To the people, Ezekiel was silent as a lamb. He was cut off from society, cut off from the land of the living. Not unlike myself. God told me, go to your room. It's where I've lived for just about 13 years now. Well, it has been 13 years. And cut me off from, from everything. Had me stop practicing law. Had me terminate my law licenses. Um, you know, at my age, and I had been in Hawaii for uh, two years before the colon cancer hit me back in 2001. And um, didn't have a whole lot of friends to stay away from to begin with. And not going to work at my age, you know, those are usually where you have your friends and people you do things with. So that was gone. And uh, my children are all married and they're all living their lives. They, they really don't know what's going on with me because I hadn't said much. I did right in the beginning, but just big question marks on top of their heads, so to speak. And uh, never really... Uh, said much about God talking to me uh, after after the initial year, I guess it was, a couple of times. As I said, you know, my, my daughter's uh, in Galveston, Texas. My son uh, is uh, in New Mexico. And uh, my uh, oldest daughter is in San Antonio. That's the best of my recollection right now. We don't talk very much. They they know I'm not happy or don't believe in that. I guess that's what it is, Jesus. And they're here in America. They consider themselves Christians. I wouldn't say they were uh, Bible thumpers by any stretch of the imagination. But um, just just saying such a thing here in America uh, will have you ost ostracized real quick. And uh, I'm sure it's something that Jews are well familiar with, the Jewish people. Uh, and, and, and to indicate that 
I believe Judaism is the religion of the three Abrahamic religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Um, by and large, people don't like to hear it here in America. They just don't. That's just the way things are. And I don't see it changing in a Messianic era. And if you watch this video, you know I'm very adamant about that. The man who is described and becomes God's righteous servant will be cut off from the land of the living and be silent as the land to all that know him while God prepares him to be suitable for his uh, purpose that might prosper. Just as he did with Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, of course, was being made suitable to be a uh, prophet to the exiles. And he was, he was actually a part of the last deportation, I understand. Or at least he was part of the exile. <clears throat> now, Jesus talked until his last breath. In one gospel, Jesus is asked, Are you going to remain silent? And his response was to talk verse after verse after verse after verse after that. That was his answer to, are you going to be silent? No, I'm not. I got plenty to say. And he was never confined to a house, to a room. Um, he was always free to move. He, I was kind of surprised to see, oftentimes, he and his 12 would stay at a mountain near Jerusalem. Never see that in any kind of movie or anything. Uh, he did not live in Jerusalem. He did have a house. I'll get to that. Verse 8. By oppressive judgment, he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. That would be the people of Isaiah, the Jewish people. Now this is another way of looking at an offering for guilt. The oppressive judgment is being guilty and receiving a sentence of imprisonment in your home or your room. And maltreatment, uh, chastisement, punishment, bruising, and crushing for the sins which causes the guilt of the Jewish people until suitable for God's purpose. Uh, <clears throat> God is, uh, he uses these verses symbolically with the offering for guilt in this verse being shown as a guilty plea before a judge of crimes not committed by the defendant. Ezekiel <clears throat> chapter 3 verse 14. The spirit seized me and carried me away. I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Okay, that would be the jailer for the oppressive judgment. Who can describe his abode and cut off from the land of the living? That's the prison. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 24. And a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And he spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. This is one of those situations God is in his spirit. The Spirit enters into Ezekiel, and in another verse he says, and I can hear God's words. The question becomes, who is it that says, he spoke to me? Well, it's a capital H, so that's God. The Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and God spoke to me and said to me, go, shut yourself up in your house. The chains, the chains that you would have and in prison and put on by the jailer, I suppose. As for you, O mortal, cords have been placed upon you, and you have been bound with them, and you shall not go out among them. That's the people. 
And that's Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 25. The judgment against Jesus by Pilate was not guilty. I find nothing wrong with this man. But to wash his hands of the whole religious controversy, Pilate asked the multitude that had gathered. And I don't know how many that is, and I don't know if the multitude was just Jews or if it included Arabs and Gentiles. And, well, Arabs are Gentiles, but it, it doesn't tell us. A multitude had gathered. That's all we have. He asked them what they would have him do with Jesus. Release him or crucify him. And the multitude said, crucify him. <laughs> that was not an oppressive judgment. It was not a judgment of being taken away or cut off. No, it was a sentence of death. That's I mean, it is oppressive, I grant you. <laughs> but it's a death sentence. This is a sentence that is onerous, difficult to bear. And you don't receive long life. This man, here he has an oppressive judgment against him. And he had all these words like wounded, bruised, crushed, chastised, punished. But he's given long life. So it's not a death sentence. Who could describe his abode? Jesus has a house in the Gospels, but it is never described. No one today could describe his abode. And Isaiah chapter 11 says that his abode shall be honored, the Messiah, who is described in Isaiah 53. This is the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 15, Holy Bible, King James Version, from the internet. And it came to pass that, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also, together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. Doesn't sound like shunned and despised to me. And, of course, today nobody can describe that abode. All of Israel will be able to describe the abode of God's righteous servant. That would be me. In this day of, of social media and phones with cameras. And it will be in Israel. It will be in Jerusalem. Now, what does it mean? It is to be honored. Uh, I don't know what that means, a fancy home, or just the fact that God's righteous servant lives there. Um, for these past 13 years, I've basically been in a room in a condo with my parents. I mean, I pretty much stay in here all the time. I go down to the kitchen every so, you know, once a day, once or twice a day. But um, before that, when I was in Hawaii, we lived in a, just a, I call it the little green shack. I mean, there wasn't anything to it at all. But we, we, the, the kids just, they were all over the, I took my oldest and, and, daughter and my son. Initially, my young, young daughter at the time uh, came out with us too for about a month. This is post-divorce. And uh, my wife had custody of all of them, but she didn't want the first two. She was getting remarried, and they were a handful, not unlike their father. I've heard that more than once. <laughs> but uh, they were having a great time. It was good for them. They needed to get away from Houston for a while, and that's why I went. And um, But that's, you know, after two years of cancer hit me, I did pass the Hawaii bar. I got the results in the hospital. But, uh, and it was difficult to take. I was, I was in enormous pain, but uh, it had to be done. You know, I, was, I had a family to take care of. Through the sin of my people who deserve the punishment. Well, Ezekiel suffers the punishment, God tells him, 
of the houses of Israel and Judah, which is for sins, for 430 days. But the houses of Judah <laughs> and Israel were defeated by the Babylonians and deported. They, they suffered their punishment in exile. God told them, if y'all don't stop, I'm going to raise up armies against you. You're going to, yeah. And so they, they suffered their punishment. There's no vicarious suffering in this chapter of Ezekiel. And God makes that clear. Basically he's saying, you're going to suffer the equivalent of what they should suffer. The exile, 430 days, pinned to the ground with your hands tied behind your back in the power of God. I don't know if that's really close, but God thought it was about right. <laughs> Sounds pretty brutal to me. I myself, because because I did something that in retrospect was about, it shows who I was when God first got to me. As he would say, when people ask you why it took 13 years to get you where I wanted you, or 13 plus years, tell them that story. He won't let me tell many, but he'll let me tell you this one. He's always saying to me, Keith, I am God. <laughs> Particularly early on. And sometimes a lot sterner than that. Well, anyway, he had driven me to almost madness. <laughs> That's how I say it. And anger. And, and then I hear, Keith, I am God. And I responded, God, I am Keith. I never did that again. <laughs> he slammed me to the ground in his power with such force, it just about knocked me unconscious. Kept me there pinned for five days. Now, he did take me on um, visions. As a matter of fact, we were had been going through the Holocaust Many visions of the Holocaust. And the thing about my visions, a great many of them, I'm literally in the vision. I'm part of it. And it's amazing what he can do in a vision with your emotions, your feelings, and your thoughts. But uh, it was a rough five days. And, um, but it went a long way in, in getting me to realize, you don't talk like that. He seems like a person. He seems like... You know, your next door neighbor who's invisible that has come over and taken over your house. <laughs> you know, they're like guests that show up at your door and they come in and they tie you up in a chair in the back room. We're going to take over now. We got everything. Don't worry about a thing. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> or, or the unwanted relatives that show up and, and you can't get rid of them. You know, <laughs> and they're driving you crazy sometimes. But that's just the brutality of going through the fire of refinement. But at the end, you know, you're so thankful. You know, I would have never been this man. You know, I could never do the things he's having me do. I watch these videos before I post them, and I'm just like, I could never do that. I was pretty glib, but not, not like he has me be. And... Uh, Laughing and smiling. It's just like a it's just like a different creature sitting there. It's me. I just it's almost dumbfounded. I'm just and I'll tell him, man, you you were something else when you're when you're operating me, the unit. <laughs> Sometimes I call it. <laughs> anyway, again, he wants you to know these things about him. He he's not just Everybody, I'm sure, especially those who seriously studied the Torah and the time, you have your own perceptions of this entity, God. Not as a man, but as a person yourself, you can't help but start adding attributes to him of a man. And uh, when he converses with you, he says, oh, one man to another man. Uh, but it doesn't take long to, to realize this is an entity of being that is nothing like man other than he exists and he does have emotions and he did create everything and of course he relates to me in a way that I can understand is that how he is of his own when it's just him and his companion the spirit probably not it's different so anyway no vicarious suffering 
God says every man is responsible for his own sins. And he tells his, his people, do not sacrifice your children. Because there was a there was another there was a false god that, that I, I don't the fire god uh, I can't remember the name right now but um, people would, would, would fire these idols up and toss their babies in as a sacrifice and the Jewish people were doing it and he told them don't sacrifice your children and what does Christianity say God sacrificed His child so we are forgiven of disobeying him. Again, when you make a human sacrifice, it's the man's camera just faded in and out. I may have to cut this short. As the man's did, they were looking for favor. They made the sacrifice so their gods would do something for them. What was God making the sacrifice of his child for the Gentiles to do for him? What was he trying to get them to do he couldn't get them to do? What's he looking for? So it's, it, I don't, you know, and they say the Hebrew Bible, the Bible he gave his children is prophetic of this human sacrifice. And again, Jesus says, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. As I told you, he did away with the system through his prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, Amos, in the Psalms. He said, no more. No more. Don't offer them to me. Stop sinning or I'm going to punish you. And that's what he did. But he didn't ever leave them. He married them. He espoused them. And he tells them, there's, there's one Psalm he said, basically he says, I don't care if every single one of you turn your back to me. I don't care if every single one of you is sinning and not practicing my laws and commandments. I'm not, I'm not leaving you. You're mine. But I will punish you. <laughs> That's God. <laughs> Verse 9. And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, Jesus was a poor man. He didn't have anything, although he did have a house. I don't have a house. And a um, poor car, or even a bicycle. <laughs> I didn't have me get rid of my bicycle. We, I had walked for 13 years like I'm in the Exodus. You know, they camped out for almost 20 of those 40 years in front of a dime who never would let them pass through. That's what, so, I mean, it's, it's as though that's just part of the story that God knew he was going to write, that he was coming from Adam. Because, see, he's with Moses. Moses wasn't allowed to go through. That means God didn't go through. Because Moses was a host of the Lord's host. The Spirit had entered him. God was in the Spirit. So God and the Spirit are in Moses, doing what they did with me, controlling everything. You're still yourself. It's not like some possession where, you know, if you watch uh, uh, Supernatural, for instance, uh, these demons will possess somebody and they push that person to the back almost like they're, they're, they're yeah, they're not part of it anymore. That's not what this, this is. You know, I'm a host and they are guests, so to speak. Uh, and they're very kind of good guests. They take care of you. They make sure you feel like yourself. They do good things for you. Even though I had to go to this fire refinement, which I'm told <laughs> ends when I get to Neblet, Ben Garyan Airport in Jerusalem. <laughs> I can't wait to get there. But, uh, and, and doing work like this, so there's been long periods where I just, you know, when writing was done, and it was just, uh, a br it's just brutal when I don't have work to do for him. Uh, he, you know, he, he said, I can always make you a little bit better. So, and again, you can read about some of, some of this a little bit more graphic in uh, the life of the righteous servant of God in Isaiah 53, which is my life. God had me type. He dictated it. He's my ghostwriter, which is, you know, really, that's something else. I mean, it's just a life of getting hurt. 
<laughs> banged up and suffering. I mean, that's that's what it's focused on, you know. So uh, there's some interesting things in there, uh, and a lot of information. But really, for to to get outside of Isaiah 53 and see other matters of the Bible that aren't ever discussed, or whether the knowledge is uh, weak like it is with Isaiah 53 today in this teaching of Israel being the, the righteous. So, um, there's a lot of other material, and there's a lot more on Jesus and his story and the scenes and, and uh, this and that. Uh, probably about seven chapters, and the rest of it is all Judaism, the Jewish people. So anyway, this this verse, uh, and then Jesus is said to, um, after he was entombed, after the crucifixion, they took him, a rich man donated his grave. That's the story written around what happened. And so they say he fits this verse. You know, but the fact is, he's still poor. <laughs> he just got buried. But, but you know, I, I think it just means because of things like uh, being raised to great heights, uh, a home uh, to be honored, you know, a, a really nice home. And um, uh, this man receives as his portion the many, that would be the many he makes righteous, and as his spoil, as his spoil, that would be the multitude. And um, presumably, you know, if, if I'm leading those kind of people in these teachings, and that's where you know God says I'm going to I'm going to dismiss the rabbis and appoint David as a ruler amongst the flock. Well, that this will be what I do is 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 the things that he would have me do, of course, as his servant, but also the matters of the book. This uh, teaching of a different end times, the mysteries of heaven, this is nothing I don't know for the most part, or uh, as far as what can be related to other human beings and understandable. So, and, and we know he's a man of suffering and had to rise to great heights. So, and then he's taken from the world. You know, he took me to poverty. So, to me, I read that and, you know, I was a poor person, but I'm going to end up rich. Verse 10. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And that through him the Lord's purpose might prosper. But the Lord chose to crush him with disease. Now, I, I think I've covered that sufficiently. Um, I'm familiar with disease. I hope my life was crushed by disease, by cancer. I was supposed to die 20 years ago. God says, I took it from you. I gave it to you, and I took it. I, <laughs> I gave you cancer, but you survived because of me. I orchestrated you getting shot through the abdomen. You're the man of suffering. A lifetime of it. And I made sure you didn't die. Now, I don't know exactly how he did that. But, uh, you know, possibly he was in the operating room and helped the surgeon's hand. I, I don't know. But it, it was it was it's very difficult to be shot in the abdomen when you when you're 18 years old. It's uh, it's very traumatic to say the least. Uh, there's little question I, I had nightmares just about all my life from from um, seeing things that you just shouldn't see in a household where there's been a number of suicides in the family and uh, as a young child and and then the trauma of being shot. Um, 
And that's what I believe was always causing these, this headache I had. That I, I, it was from biting down, was inability to sleep good, nightmares, which is a, a, a byproduct of post-traumatic shock disorder. And that's what I thought my problem was. And I was destroying my jaw joint by all the biting down. And as I also just mentioned in the last video, God controls my dreams. So that stopped. But he also uh, was causing that pain. He was causing me to do that because, again, I'm the man of suffering. He came to me in the womb to make sure I fit these verses. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's the only proof I can offer you that I actually offered myself for guilt to him. Guilt that was just a test, which I'm about to get to one more time, I'll run through it, because that's novel, that's new, but it all fits. That's the thing about all these teachings in, in Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord, and in my book. I mean, once he, once he speaks to me, I mean, the first six or seven chapters are just brief histories of, of accidents I went through, and uh, of my life, and just kind of a chronology, you know, I went to school, how that happened, uh, always getting in trouble, leaving home, you know, the works. And, um, you know, failing ninth grade, barely getting into college, I had to go on a, I had to go into summer school. The only reason I even went to college is because I got shot. It changed, and God says, well, I knew what, how it was going to change you. And it did. I finally realized, you know, you can't just fool around in this life. I need to do something with myself, and uh, because I wasn't going to get out of high school, I, I had just failed too many classes, uh, mostly because I, I I just didn't like it. <laughs> well, I wanted to be elsewhere, so I was always skipping school and this and that, and like I said, getting in fights and getting uh, suspended and thrown out, and I got thrown out of one school. Again, another alteration with the principal. I mentioned when in the second grade I had an altercation. And then I had another one in high school and they told me to cut my hair. And, and uh, I did. You know, I, I, I always wore my hair in a ponytail. It was nice and neat. It was long, long, long way there. And, and I reported to the principal to show him. And you know he got up out of his desk walked behind me, I'm sitting in a chair, and grabbed me by the back of the head and yanked my head back and said, it's still over your collar. <laughs> I think I did a backflip out of that chair. I'm not sure what happened, but I do know it took several people to pull me off of him. That's how volatile I was. I mean, I was just, God, God would say, tell him. And God said, that's what I had to deal with. That's why it's taking so long. The fury of my spirit. So, um, I, I tell you, well, you know, David, what can I say? I got some DNA in me that is a little bit different from maybe others. I'm not sure. Again, so far removed. That's why I'm a twig. So far removed as a descendant of David. But uh, anyway, so. And the Lord chose to cross him by disease. Again, he wants that man blemished. He knows the Gentiles are going to come up with the unblemished Lamb of God. He used Leviticus. You sacrifice the Lamb, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> and so they used a the human being. And he made sure you can't do that. Except they did it anyway. It's like, it's, it's, I, I don't understand it. How, how can you read crucifixion and the man lives? <laughs> Makes me righteous by his knowledge. Now, I know it says might. He might have on He might see his children. But that's just part of the test of devotion. That's what it's about. And it's a test because there's nothing to offer yourself for. That's why the angel comes before them. The angel's here before he ever starts teaching me the scripture. And the Jews don't know it, but they're sin free. I, I have to announce it. My books announce it, by the way. It's another reason I'm probably having trouble getting them published. It's just too much for these the, the publishers or whoever's reviewing the books. They they get they make it to a review and they say, Well, it's really not our it's not our thing. That's where it comes out to me. It is not our thing. And I'm like, Well, I know, but you need to know 
that your thing needs an adjustment. And you need these, your people that you're supposed to need to see this. But uh, to know that, I don't worry about that. Because again, this is God's day. It's his problem. I mean, I already know. He knows it's going to get done, so I don't have to worry about it. It's his day. It's his people. It's his temple. He's the one who wants to be back in Jerusalem. His people are back. Great. Great. I want to be part of it. <laughs> but I'm not going to worry about it because I know you're going to do it. You got it. You can say, Mike, prosper all you want. I'm going to go with, it's going to happen. Somehow, some way. And I also know that my long life is going to be real long because I can tell it's going to take a long time to get all this done. <laughs> That's a good thing too. Oh no. And he's promised me. And he knows this is what I want more than anything in the world. An Indian Scout 60 Bobber Blackened. <laughs> Motorcycle. I had a Harley once. And... Uh, it was my first motorcycle, and I just, I just love riding. It's just, my, I just love riding. And he's, he's dangling that in front of me. And of course, I've been in poverty for 13 years now, and that's, I, I, I don't think about the abode, having money to buy a soda or anything. It's just, I can really get a motorcycle. You gonna let me ride a motorcycle? Uh, as the Moshe? In, in that kind of. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I will have one in Jerusalem. And I'll get there somehow. So anyway, here's what an offering for guilt is. Uh, Toby Singer, in his Midrash on 53, says that that, that phrase, uh, uh, he offers himself for guilt, means literally, guilt offering, let's go to Leviticus. And he finds that the six million that God, he comes up with God sacrificed the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. Now it, none of it works. I'm not even going to try and get into it. I, he's a brilliant man. He's got knowledge from <laughs> sea to sea. You know, it's like an encyclopedia on the Bible. But boy, the reasoning capabilities on that particular verse right here, verse 10, just left him, in my opinion, because Israel is a man, they had to gather as one. See, it all started with the first covenant. All the Israelites gathered into a man, as the man Israel, they agreed to the covenant, saying, we will abide by all of your laws and commandments Moses gives us, which it turns out includes an oral tradition. If you will be our God, and we will be your people. I, I, when, when did they ever regather anywhere? Crushed with disease, or brought to grief with illness in, in the uh, New Testament. And then, and then have long life and make the many righteous. It, it just can't happen, it doesn't happen. And this verse is written because not only is the man blemished, because God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. He knew what Judaism was going to have. And, and a guilt offering in Leviticus is an unblemished ram. None of these people were unblemished, number one. Number two, who offered them? Did Hitler offer them? He didn't get long life and make the many righteous. Those people didn't get long life and make the many righteous. I don't know what he's thinking. I really don't. But I know he's a good man. And uh, he, he, he practices Judaism to the T, I'm sure, as an Orthodox Jew. But, you know, really. And, of course, as with all rabbis, he's dismissed. He's no longer in right standing with God. But he's got a long way to come back because he's going to have to straighten that out. He needs to get hold of these books. And, and I do want to relate to him. That's why I'm saying Well, that's why God's had me say to him, I want it. It doesn't matter to me either way. I just do what I'm told. I say what I'm told to say. I'm commanded to do it. You don't say no to God. And, and that's another thing about being crushed with cancer. God can come to you. Like I said, he just sees Ezekiel. But you're not going to say no to him. 
if he says, I want you to be my righteous servant and do, thing, or dedicate your life to what I tell you to do. And that includes when you go to sleep and when you wake up. That includes what you eat. That includes when you eat. That includes when I have you exercise. I control everything. You no longer have self-will. You say yes. You go ahead. Yeah. You, you, hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an automatic. So that's what it was for. In verse 10, verse 10 is, is to prevent anybody from saying from the, Jewish, uh, from the Jewish side that this could be a man. It can't be a man. Especially cannot be an unblemished lamb, a perfect man. See, I am this man, and I am the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, this, this, you can't put us in the same sentence without having the sentence blow up. You just, you can't do it. But I don't who fits it. Not a perfect, handsome, beautiful, charming, pleasing, intelligent, sinless. So he says. I don't know. False prophecy. I'm going to come back. He doesn't do it. Is that a sin? Is that lying? Is it deceit? Um, but this this whole Zechariah thing, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride into Jerusalem on an ass as all of the prophets say of me. I shall be mocked, spit on, scourged, killed, and rise on the third day. And yet, and yet the prophecy says the man will ride an ass into Jerusalem. And the next verse is it's summed up: defeat Rome in his time. Today it would be. Throw the Palestinians out of Israel. Get them out of there. Make them go to Jordan. Tell them, that's it. We're not having them. You're not going to keep launching bombs at us. You're not going to live inside our land. This is God's land. You can't come in here and possess it. You can't adversely possess it. To God, you're the trespassers. That's what he would call you. That's what he does call you. I don't want those trespassers in my land. I want my temple on the temple mount. Uh, he said, I don't care about their mosque. I ain't care about our synagogues. He says, oh, i got to have an excuse, and I don't. I get the feeling. If we weren't in the modern era, <laughs> with satellites and television and social media, that he'd just say, you know, drive them into the sea. And their families. Just, just like the promised land with the Israelites. Drive them into the sea. Get them off. Take the women and children. Take their stuff. And take their animals. And drive them into the sea. Just to be done with him. See, he's not a human being. <laughs> he is a being that has a whole different agenda and idea about everything. And of course, I live learning his perspective on things. And, and I get it. It takes a while, but you do get it. This, <laughs> he just has a different way of thinking. So, uh, but you know, of course, I love it. It's great. So, anyway, who could just, let me get back to where I was and finish up. The speaker of verses 11 and 12 is God, and I'll pick that up on another video and, and end my, um, basically my video midrash on Isaiah 53. I think I've covered just about everything. So anyway, well, here's uh, passing the test of devotion is when I really started learning about a host and a man divine beings. I, I didn't, I didn't understand the. Con I mean, he hadn't even taught it to me. I don't think I really got it until we were actually writing uh, the book, putting chapters together and adding new material. But you know, it's one God of Israel, one angel of his presence, and one man, Hushiah, the anointed one, in this case me. At one time it, it, it was, you know, any of the prophets that wrote for him 
Moses. And, and there's some stories. God left little hints in the Torah that, that the scholars of the Torah and the town will, will be surprised. And not a lot, just a little bit, to, uh, to, to back up some of the things I say. Uh, things that had to do with that bright white face he had when he came back down the mountain the second time. What that was about. And uh, his attendant, Joshua. Uh, and that was, that's, that's the name that Moses gave him. That's, that's not his original name. And it wasn't his name at the time that he was following Moses up the mountain and living in his tent with Moses. And then after, after the bright white face that he had to cover up, the attendant disappeared. He's, he's just like, Moses come down the mountain and he's not waiting on him. And he's not in the tent. And then he, he would stay in the tent when Moses left. You know who he represents? The angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Holy God. And that it, that that's the symbolic, you you are now a sinless person. Then that would be me. I can't sin. I don't even have self-will. I can't even, <laughs> you know, God controls me now. And, you know, it's just fine. I'm old. I don't want to do any sins. I've had my wild days. I told God, God said, uh, you know, we got to this part, verse 12, he's a sinner. I said, you know, I never really thought myself that, of that much of a sinner. I was, a, I was good to other people. And, uh, you know, I tried to do the right thing. Didn't really know anything about Ten Commandments or anything else. I'd seen the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, of course. Everybody has. And uh, he he said, you, you don't think you're much of a sinner, huh? And all of a sudden, I'm Scrooge in that story. And I, uh, Christmas, the, the ghost of Christmas past is taking me on visions. And in these visions, it's like I'm back there. You know, it's, it, it, it's like the first time you start a car. You know, you can remember, man, I'm, I felt so great the first time I drove a car. You know, when you're young. But you can't really get that feeling back. He puts it back in me. I can literally feel as I did the moment I first started and drove a car. The excitement, the ambience that was around me at the time. Everything is absolutely amazing. But I also found out it was quite the center. But I wasn't a habitual center of, of any particular type of sin. It just seemed like I hit, in, <laughs> hit just about all of it. And as the Christian says, if you've had murder in your heart, you're a murderer. Okay, well, I even caught that one because it is, I was, I'd get so angry sometimes. It was like, hold me back. This is it. Where's my guns? <laughs> no, I never killed anybody. I, 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 I don't even hunt. I've never hunted. I, I, can't, I can't even kill animals. I don't even like stepping on a bug. And I never have. It's always been me. But again, he's been with me. There's little things about my personality. That, uh, that that made me a better person without me knowing it, but without any particular extreme. I don't know who I'd have been if he hadn't come to me in my first year. I don't know. Uh, I'm just, it's something that we've been working on more lately than any other time in the last 13 years. You know, uh, and I tell you, it doesn't really matter to me. To me, I'm just me. Uh, my disfigurement, that's just me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me that you say you did it. And I believe him. I said, you know, he did. Uh, it, you know, I loved running, and it really hindered me in track because you need two strong arms for a quick start to drive out of the box and everything. And um, but, the, but one thing that never happened, which is surprising, because he said part of the reason I did it is so that people would pick on you. And, and bully you and this and that because that's what happens to young Jewish people. I wanted you to feel as best I could the suffering of the Jewish people in every way imaginable, including the wounding, the crushing, the bruising, uh, the maltreatment. And um, But the, the fact is nobody ever made fun of me about this arm. And it could have been I looked like because I wouldn't smile, and it's like I had a friend tell me, it looks like you, you, when you look at people like you want them to say something bad so you can launch into them. 
and maybe that's why. Uh, but uh, but anyway, he's he's changed. I'm not that person. Not that person. <laughs> it did take him 13 years, which I think is a little ridiculous. Personally, I I always say, look, more power, less suffer. What is wrong with that? He said, Keith, I am God. I can decide these things. I decide how long it takes. I know what you need. I know where you have to be. And I say, you're not where I want you. And I just say, 13 years is all I got to say. <laughs> all of a sudden, I feel my, my foot getting crushed with the invisible hand. One of his favorite ways to wake me up sometimes. Two invisible hands just grabbing your feet in your deep sleep. And, you know, I come up and I utter his favorite phrase for me. What is wrong with you? <laughs> he makes him laugh. He says, nothing wrong with me. I'm God. Morning, God. And the day begins. It's not always like that. I think I'm done. I mean, I have a lot of things written, but I've covered them through all these videos, one way or another. Okay, this is, this is the last of the verses by Isaiah. Uh, the third and last speaker is the Lord in verses uh, 11 and 12, and I'll pick those up in, a, in a, another in the last video on this um, Midrash of Isaiah 53 on camera. I, I, I hope you take these serious. It's a serious business. We're talking about destruction to the land of Israel. They say, that's what I think of. And of course, he puts these thoughts in me and to make me feel like it's actually my responsibility. If no, I know better. It's not my responsibility because I don't control anything. But I still feel it. Just like I still feel like me when I know he's having me say words that I wouldn't be saying. Um, it's very complicated. And it does take a long time. And, and I do it again, even if I didn't have this wonderful task in front of me. I mean, to go to Israel, to know, you know, I, I, I'll be able to earn a living again and, and have things and help people understand his personality and, and be instrumental in having the temple built someday. Could be 20 years from now. I'm 63. Moses was, was 80. When God spoke to him, meant to be 120. I don't want to be 120. Uh, you know, is that story? <laughs> or was he really 60 and lived to be 100? You never know with God. He throws a lot of stuff into his stories, but the fact is, though, everything happens on the ground. It's, it's kind of like you see a movie and it says, based on true story. You know, because God said, you know, it's like the dialogue. He said, if you heard the way they talk to each other sometimes, he said, in the Bible, it might say, and Jacob said, yeah, or Saul said, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> or Saul said, no. And uh, it may have been a gesture. God said, okay, and Saul said, no. Because <laughs> if you read the dialogues, they're all the same throughout the book. <laughs> yeah, and it's like third grade reader. You know, it's very proper, very clean, very... And, and, and God said, you know, I, I, these books had to sell. <laughs> they had to get around. I had to add some story to it to make it interesting, but I put in my philosophy, the morality. So there's, there's so much behind it. And that's why the Jewish people study Torah so hard. And Torah is like an, almost an entity to them that God created before he created uh, the, the planet, earth, people. And he did, but what they need to know is, it's not just the Torah he had written. It's the entire Hebrew Bible that he had before creation. The entirety, even the Psalms, he had written. Now he writes them in antiquity, so they read as though they come from antiquity. But, you know, he's talking to his Isaiah wrote Isaiah. He, that's what he told me to think about. He says, sometimes I had to get other people to finish or do this, or do that. He said, but when you're reading it, understand that while there is a lot of story, I could have made any of it happen. All of them are within my powers, all stories. 
And I'm not talking about express miracles like in the Exodus where he, he flat out says he's done it. But it's like you see Elijah. And, you know, he's calling down the fire at the sacrifice of the bulls with the... <clears throat> with uh, everybody in Jerusalem having come outside to watch it all with uh, <laughs> the bad guys. <laughs> I can't remember the name of that man. He's not giving it to me. He did. You know, you think if God's going to tell you, you'd be a perfect person. You'd be like a Jesus. No, I'm still key. He listen, I'm still me. No, I can't sing it, but uh, I can still, you know, I can argue and get angry and uh, nothing like you would think of Jesus, so to speak. And he, he's not part of this, you know. Uh, there's nothing written about him in his time. And everything was a story back then. It's a great story. And like I said, there's all kinds of variations to it. And the fact is, I don't believe he ever existed. And I have it on good authority. He didn't. I'm the Moshiach. And I bring God's wrath. And I bring his reckoning. We'll finish up with what God has to say on 11 and 12 another video. <laughs> I can't believe it is that he's saying that. That's from God himself. Uh, the Lord said. And what I just said. Yeah, that's how it works. You just do it. Thank you, y'all. Everybody.